confidants to another episode of Confidently Insecure, the podcast. Oh, I drank too much coffee. Where we are absolutely sure we don't know everything. And I am so freaking hyped to give this week's guest a platform other than TikTok because he is one of my favorite TikTok creators. Appreciate He's got a that. book out where he, it's called You've Already Won, A Journey Through Education and Nursing and Mental Health Awareness. He's got an archived podcast where you can all understand how to be a DNP, which is a doctor, nurse practitioner. He works at Visions TV which is a mental health treatment center for youth, mental health, and like I said, one of my favorite TikTokers. Welcome, Kojo! Thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> now, we've been talking for a minute, and right. I'm already trying to guess your astrological sign, Okay, but you're much more chill in person than you are on your TikTok, so I'm trying to decipher like what actually your sign is. Can you give it a guess? I don't want to be like way, way wrong, but I'm going to guess cancer. Uh, Sagittarius. Oh, wow. Okay. So I was way off. Um, I don't know if that's closer or way <laughs> off. Or... Uh, so when's your birthday? Is sooner uh, than later? November 23rd. Oh, it just passed. Wow. Right. I'm way off. Ignore yeah. all of that. Um, but we were also laughing because we've had to reschedule this podcast twice. Right. Once because of you and once because of me. And I mm -hmm. didn't tell you the reason why I had to cancel the first time. I said I had like an accident. Right. Well, the accident was me being on the phone and then I was trying to sit on a yoga ball all right. on a concrete floor. And as soon as I sat, the yoga ball like popped out from underneath me and I just hey. went straight flat back onto a concrete floor mm -hmm. and I was on a phone call and I literally went ah! and like all of the breath a freak accident. <laughs> and I could not fucking move and I have had like a pain player for like two weeks now because of it uh-huh just, I'm just the most dramatic person you'll ever meet but this podcast is about me this podcast is all about you Kojo what the fuck is your story because you are a mental health TikTok creator, which is very right. far few in between. And right. even more so, you are a man right. who talks about mental health. Even right. deeper, you are a black man that talks right. about mental health. And when I saw you, I was just like, oh, I appreciate that. how the fuck did you get involved in this? And why the fuck do you care about mental health? It's crazy because, you know, obviously you have to go back to, you know, me in high school, I wasn't a good student, so I had no idea what I was going to do in my life. My dad was like, you know what? You don't know what you want to do. You don't have a good GPA. Just try nursing school for a year or two. So I did it, and I did it with the intention to not fail. So I kept not failing before you know, I graduated. And then I go. took a job in the ICU, and then I had student loans. So the opportunity came up for me to work at a psychiatric hospital, Whoa. and uh, they would help me out with the loans. So I took that job, and you know, obviously the rest is history. I got into the psych ward. It was unlike anything I've ever seen before. Like it was so wow. weird to walk into a psych ward and like to see patients. Like I walked in there expecting to see people like fighting and like yeah. hearing voices, but I didn't, people were watching TV. People were minding their own business. Like I was just waiting <laughs> for the okie doke, you know? Yeah. And uh, it's funny because not a lot of people know it, but I try to quit the job. Oh you know? yeah? Yeah, I, I, I try because it was so weird and like, it's not, like you don't have a lot of it's not reputable to work at a psych ward right or to really? tell people that you do that yeah so i try I to put the job that. yeah I, you know like well, at least let's say within nursing you know or even yeah. uh within psychiatry like people want to work in prestigious like hospitals but like to work in a psych ward it's not like the place that everybody wants to go to so mm. i try to quit the job initially uh and there was a hospital that uh it was an icu hospital down the street that was uh paying more mm. and they had a sign-on bonus so oh. what i did was i i was working two full-time job at the same time but i was planning wow. to quit the job at the psych hospital right so i didn't want to quit so i wanted them to fire me so i kept showing up late to work <laughs> but they were so sure that they wouldn't fire me and it just so You're happened trying that, to get that employee that unemployment <laughs> right and it just so happened Severance. that the other job once the other job like the orientation, because I like talking to people. So yeah. the orientation part of the other job was fine. We're just talking, you know, we're just shooting the shit. Everything felt so good. But then when I had to get on the floor and like you have to actually move patients and, yeah. like, and like give shots, I'm like, whoa, I can't Oof. do this type of work anymore. You know, so yeah. I waited two more days until I could get the sign on bonus. I cashed it in 
and I resigned from that hospital and I Shut stayed at the psych up. hospital. You so, took that yeah. money. <laughs> and they actually put me on the do not rehire list at the Shut, hospital. What? Yeah, because I just came, I got the money and I dipped out. Damn, uh, but you know what? Fuck the system. Right. Take that bag because there is too many of us that have been fucked over by that mental health True. system. It's it's uh, uh, beautiful. Right. Move. So I ended up staying at the psych hospital and it was the best move I've ever made because if I hadn't stayed, I wouldn't have learned more about mental health and mm. like I wouldn't have become the person that I am today. But yeah, as I stayed, I, I began to see how the patients were so similar to us. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you know what, I want to kind of do this for a living. So I, I started mm. to, you know, learn more and more. And then I started to talk about it online. And then things kind of went from there, you know, and I tell people all the time that initially I got on Instagram, let's say 2011, 2010, whatever it came out, because people were taking pictures of themselves, right? And yeah. like, you would get on there to like, talk to the girls or like to look yeah, at girls. Right. And then I started to see that women were using the platform to sell things. Like, w- like we were focused on the women. They were selling hair They were products. focusing on becoming entrepreneurs. Right. <laughs> they were selling all kinds of things. And I'm like, you know what? This doesn't make sense. I'm out here trying to look at you, but you're using this platform for like a, the greater good. Yeah. And I realized that you could use social media or Instagram for right. like something bigger than yourself. So Absolutely. I started to put up my story and people were gravitating to what I was yeah. talking about. And then over time, like TikTok eventually came out and then yeah. I just kept doing the same thing. And it just kind of took off from there. Well, I applaud you for, you know, keeping up with the like social impact, because I think that that's really the only way that we've been able to make a big shift in mental health and like right. breaking stigmas because- mm-hmm. We're not seeing it on TV. We're not seeing it in the media, like the, you know, traditional media. We're not reading about it in the newspaper and all of the, you know, books and psychiatry shit still sounds so clinical and is still so like such a privileged system that I really think it's because of social media that our generation has been able to say like, Hey, we're the ones suffering. Why don't we have right. like a, a a say in any of this? Right. And um, that's like you know why I wrote my book. I don't know where it is. I have like a thousand companies. I'm definitely gonna send you one. But my first book I was called that. Don't, don't fucking panic. panic. Don't, don't yeah, fucking panic. Right. Mm-hmm. and it, you know I don't go into it too much, um, just because it didn't feel like it was um, it was more for my dependency on clonopin through panic mm-hmm. attacks. Um, but I did go to an inpatient treatment center mm-hmm. and I also did an out intensive outpatient treatment center. And those people who worked in there were my favorite fucking people, like all the doctors and like right. people that were prescribing shit. I was like, you guys are just another cog in the system and the right. wheel. But there's something about you guys that work there because I had no idea it was, um, kind of like looked down upon in the uh, industry, if you will. But I think it like, arguably, y'all's job is one of the most important. I I agree. In someone getting better. It's definitely up there. And now we're in the middle of a pandemic and now (sighs) the the focus is on mental health, but it should have always been that way. But we had to wait for this to happen before people could understand that it's important to take care of your mental health. You know, so I feel like I'm, you know, fortunate to have worked oh, yeah. in such an environment and, you know, like you get to keep it real and the system is somewhat outdated as well. Like I remember mm-hmm. having a patient who, uh, when I was in school, I was riding with the psychiatrist, you know, he's teaching me all these different things. And he looked at a patient, it was a young black guy, maybe 19 or 20. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, the patient was talking or dancing or whatever. And then like, in his notes, he's like, okay, psychotic, boom, 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 boom. We'll give him this, this, that. But then I'm like, hold up. I'm like, he's rapping the Young Thug song. I know that song, <laughs> you know? But he, like, he was rapping like, uh, and I'm like, I, I know that song. But like, and the psychiatrist, I mean, he's Indian, of course, like a different right. culture. He doesn't understand that, okay, right. like, he, he's just rapping his favorite song. But like, yeah. the words look disorganized. It looks like maybe he's mm-hmm. schizophrenic. So mm-hmm. we have to change the way that we approach mental health because mm-hmm. if you think about it, you know, the DSM and everything that we oh. base our belief system on, it might be outdated because if minorities never sought mental health care, then it's not based, it's based off of what we've seen. So there's a lot that we have to change up in the game. Kojo, you just gave me 
my hairs are standing on end. Like what you just said, I've never been able to articulate, but everything about mental health has been centered around white men who come up with it and then catered to white people. Like what you just said, we will never be able to change it if we're not giving access to actual like standard of care to minorities. That is, oh, exactly. Exactly the truth. truth. And, you know, I've seen it myself in the system where, you know, they pick, I've literally seen a nurse give a bed to a white guy over a black man because she probably thought he could benefit more from it. Mm. You know, like this guy looked a little bit more for the wear, like he's kind of been through it. And, and the white guy, you know, had family with him that was like, we will pay whatever, whenever, like we just need a bed. And those beds are so um, crucial and yeah, and and rare and and very expensive. And it's heartbreaking to see. So can you talk a little bit about like, how we can kind of start to break that stigma because I have no fucking clue. Like, how do we change the system? Well, we have to first start talking about it, you know, and that's why I make content about like being at a psych ward because people think about it, you know, like straight jackets and being tied down, but it's not like that. No. And it's actually the fastest way to get help, you know, mm. in my opinion. Because if somebody's coming in and if, let's say they're suicidal, homicidal, they're extremely anxious, oppressed, mm-hmm. all of this stuff, like, if they go to the ER and they get sent out, I think in California, they, it's 5150 here. Yeah. But we call it 1013 back in Georgia. Yeah. Or in Virginia is TDO, temporary detention order. So once you get to a psych ward, that's the fastest way to get help. You know, because mm. now, like, we see you every single day. We're able to give you medications. We know that we have to draw labs four days after this, blah, blah, blah. So it's actually the fastest way to get help. So if you think of it as, you know, like, crisis stabilization this is for you know the short term Mm, mm -hmm. if it's done properly you will get the help that you need and then you can follow up on the outpatient side of things right the issue is a lot of times like certain facilities like if it's state run you Mm. might be on the waiting list to get in or if it's a private institution then Mm -hmm. it becomes the issue of the haves and have nots absolutely so if you have the money great if you don't have it it's like you have to struggle or you know i've seen people lie and say that they're going to hurt themselves with somebody else to get wow. in because wow. like the waiting yeah. list is so long so like if you don't want to wait three four five months to see yeah. a psychiatric provider like you might like people would say like you know i'm gonna hurt myself and then they yeah. get in the hospital you know so it's it's messed up how the system is like we have to have yeah. first of all we need more providers and yep. then we need more hospitals and we mm-hmm. need more money to be in these systems and then mm-hmm. preventive care is the best you oh. know so you you were talking about, you know, clump and a lot of times people get burnt out on my side of things. So once mm-hmm. somebody comes in and that was happening to me, I was getting a little burnt out. That's why I came to California wow. to make the source of social media. Cause I, I was seeing myself becoming the person that looks at a mm. patient like, okay, I have three admissions and two discharges. And instead of it being a patient, it's like, okay, I have to do X, Y, and Z, get it done, get in and get out. You know, right. so it's easy to throw clump at somebody cause it'll yep. fix it. It'll fix the <laughs> issue like right then and there. Yeah. But then you're creating one problem on top of, you know, fixing a short term problem. It's just, it's it's a a bad solution. The the whole system is, is like, and and like I said, even us as providers, we're also getting burnt out too. So it's like, who takes care of the person who who takes care of other people? Wow. That's a good question. How do you self care? I mean, besides weed brownies. (laughs) Uh, so uh, by being as selfish as possible, I have to. Ooh, I love that. I have to do things that uh, it makes sense for me, you know. Mm. So setting boundaries, like sometimes telling my parents that I don't feel like doing this, or I don't mm. want to do this, or um, like doing a certain thing. Like now I'm real with myself. Like I would, like I told my little brother, I said, you know what, I don't give money out anymore. Because when I first yeah. started to make it, like I was just. Like I had all my friends like, oh, yo, I got you, I got you, I got you, I got you. Uh, and then in our culture, you know, coming from West Africa, it's like you mm, want to do for your parents to put right. them on. So okay. I told a story once Once I, I came home, I gave my parents $400 each. And wow. then it started a system of I felt like to be a good son, I had to give them money. Mm. So I got to the point where I said, you know what? Giving out money lowers my self-esteem. Wow. So I had to stop doing that. And 
once I pull back, I don't have issues with family, with friends, with wow, uh, literally with everything. So like, if something doesn't make sense to me, I'm not going to do it. Uh, and with self care, I have to be as selfish as possible. You I know? love so the, that. The things that I enjoy doing, uh, those are non negotiable. So if I like oh. to go electric bike riding, or if I want to go play basketball or video games, like I'm not going to budge for anything or anybody because that's yes. what like makes me me. You know, I call myself selfish all the fucking time. And I think we have to kind of like take away the negative connotation that comes with it because you are a giver. You're giving, you're giving, you're giving your people are taking, taking, taking all week. And like, thank God for Mm. people like you that have that capability and no one, you know, setting boundaries, I think is such a beautiful thing. And the only people that disrespect boundaries are people that don't respect you. And so right. the fact that you're <laughs> able to like tell that story, yeah, like, that's true. I'm so like glad that. everything worked out for mm. the best. Um, I, I want to go back a little bit to where you said something about changing the system and you said mm. preventative care is like crucial. Right. And it made me think like, you know, not only myself, like I've, I've dealt with panic disorder and anxiety and depression and mood disorder. And I was like misdiagnosed bipolar. And like, you know, I've had all these ups and downs Mm -hmm. with my mental health. And then someone very close to me, um, experiences hypomania and psychosis. And I thought I had seen like the crazy, I hate the word crazy, but I also love it. Like I've, I thought I've seen the most like crazy part of mental health. And then Mm -hmm. I saw what like a hypomanic, like bipolar episode can really look like. And I was like, Oh shit. It shouldn't have gotten this Mm -hmm. bad. Like it should not have gotten to this point. Right. It like, there should have been so many steps that were covered Mm -hmm. before getting to this hospitalization point. And I think it goes back to that same shit of like, we don't have enough providers. We don't have enough Mm -hmm. accessibility and it costs. Why does it cost so much money to get your mind right? It's crazy. You know, I mean, some private hospitals, it might might cost like 1500 or more a day uh, for a bed, you know, fuck. right. So, so I, I mean, to be honest, like I see why people will like heroin is cheaper, Yeah. you know, to, to be honest, like, Heroin is cheaper, so I see why people self-medicate things mm-hmm. like you know like that because it'll cost you this much to get to fix your problems for today, yes. and it'll cost you so much to actually get right. You mm. know, so can you blame people when the help isn't you know in place? You know, so it's about empathy. No. Like you have to see oh. why people are doing what they're doing, and in terms of preventative care, certain people can't do certain things, right? So mm. if you have like if alcoholism runs in your family, then mm-hmm. like you have to be careful. You know, if you have an addictive personality, you have to be careful. If uh, schizophrenia is deep in your family, you have to be very careful with, mm. with marijuana because oh, it yeah. can trigger psychosis. Whereas yep. the next person, Wiz Khalifa can smoke it and, <laughs> and become a, a Grammy, you know, when an artist, but maybe it's not in his family. So right. if, you're, if you're bipolar, you have to be careful with stress. Make sure that you're mm. not under too much stress. Make sure that you're getting enough sleep. sleep. Maybe yeah. you can't hang out all night like your friends because it might trigger a manic episode. So yep. we, we all have to be aware and figure out yeah. what self-care is for us because self-care yeah. is different for each person. And at different points throughout the year, self-care is going to look different for mm. you. Wow. Yeah. That's, I mean, you bring up a good point. Like no part, what time of year it is. Like it's never going to be one way all the time. Like you don't get happy. and It's like, well, I figured it out. I'm done. I'm just this way now. It's like life is supposed to be a roller coaster. Like things are supposed Mm -hmm. to happen in life. Good things, bad things. Um, I want to hone in a little bit on talking about like men in mental health, because Mm -hmm. what I'm seeing a lot, not only, you know, in my personal mental health circles, but also what's been brought out to light in the media, especially like since George Floyd, is that yeah. we're seeing a lot of men get to these points of not saying George Floyd, but others, you know, now that it, we have cell phones and it being public, mm-hmm. um, go into these kind of psychotic episodes. And there's right. a big fucking difference between being hypomanic and being mm-hmm. in psychosis. And I, right. I think people don't know when we're like Mm -hmm. teetering the line and if you can catch it early if you can catch them in that that ramped up state is what i call it Mm -hmm. like you can completely avoid the psychosis but usually 
you don't know with men that they're truly bipolar until they have a psychotic episode. Right. And unfortunately, what we're seeing in the media, especially with black men, is that they're asking for help. We're mm-hmm. calling crisis lines and cops are being sent and people are being killed. Right. And, you know, we talk about preventing um, and I think with men, there's this idea of like, you can't talk about feelings without being perceived as weak in exactly. your culture. You can't cry. You can't show emotion. So like, mm-hmm. talk to me about being a guy who is so willing to kind of break that. Right. So it comes from my professional experience and also my personal experience. So on the professional side of things, obviously, you know, as a minority or as a black man, if I go into a hospital and let's say, um, amped up and a a white guy goes into a hospital i'm more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia Mm. you know because like you're perceived to be more aggressive you know wow so if we're talking about psycho every time i psychosis right within the context of schizophrenia like Uh delusions hallucinations disorganized Uh thinking you know paranoia we have to separate that from like a rational fear so if you're a black guy and you're afraid of the cops pulling you over, I would call that a rational fear. Yeah, absolutely. You know, but somebody else might think that it's paranoia. And also in terms of like mania, you know, like you would see or, or, or hypomania, like mm-hmm. for four days or so, like you'd see right. somebody not get enough sleep, you know, somebody yeah. have an elevated mood, do things that are outside of what you would normally do. So, you know, if you're somebody who you spend money, you know, mm-hmm. a lot, but then now you're maxing out every credit card you have, you yeah. start to get concerned. So you have to, for, first of all, it's really tough to lock in on a diagnosis of bipolar. Like sometimes pe- people <laughs> wait like a decade to get an accurate diagnosis, and sometimes Oof. people are misdiagnosed. Yeah. It can look like ADHD, it can look like anxiety. Mm. So a lot of times we don't even know until we get a comprehensive like evaluation, and then mm. we have to, you know, get collateral information from the family member, mm. spouse, and all, all this different stuff. So the most important thing I would say is to go get the help. You yeah. know, and for me, I'm open because like throughout my life like i've seen like like working in the psych hospitals like i had a a guy who he was admitted and he was wanting to fight all the staff and he was throwing chairs and i think a a year before he had lost his child you know in an accident so he never saw anybody he never spoke to anybody about anything and it built up all this frustration to the point where like you never got the chance to grieve so now it's a year later and you're still stuck at denial you know so we have to talk about what is making us frustrated, you know? Yeah. So like even me personally, like I wouldn't speak up in, you know, relationships or things like that. Or mm. like I used to honestly, like I would see people like cheat and I thought, that, okay, I can do this because like, you know, like I'm successful on the outside. So nobody mm-hmm. cares as long as I don't get caught. Wow. So I thought yeah. that if you don't get caught, you're the same as a person who never does it. Wow. You know, so like I was <laughs> living, <laughs> I was living my own type of lifestyle yeah. and I'm sure like maybe ex girls ex-girlfriends mm-hmm. watching it are like this guy is your mental health advocate <laughs> but no, you're you know, fucking human it, it, right and, and that's the thing like when you have no desire to be you know a different version of yourself mm. then you can be authentic and you can help other people because everybody's trying to put on for mm-hmm. social media or, or put on for friends but we we all make these mistakes so you have yeah. to be transparent with yourself and you have to figure out there's a reason why you're doing what you're doing so mm. like like what's going on like for yeah. me my parents didn't give me coming from like the African background, we didn't mm. get the chance to make decisions coming up. So when I was an adult, it was hard to make a decision. Wow. So at one point it was difficult for me to say no to like a girlfriend because I'm used to like the people uh, pleasing thing. Yeah. So it's all about connecting the dots. So once I wow. figured that out, I'm like, okay, no, I have to have boundaries with this. I don't like doing this. So I'm not going to do this. And yeah. like everything goes to like communication and, and respect. And even mm. like, well, guys, I tell them, don't even worry about, sex worry about respect because you Mm. you might even get you might get the girl you want the hot girl you want but after after the chase like you might feel like like you you might not feel good people have to feel good about themselves so respect uh, and boundaries is the most important thing you know and if somebody doesn't validate how you feel um then like we talk about breaking the stigma but like I want to break the stigma and I want people to talk about mental health awareness and the importance of it, Mm -hmm. but I'm going to tell you my story and tell you where I know professionally and personally. Right. And then after that, I'm going to move on. I'm not going (laughs) to wait for you to understand what's going on because you're going to be frustrated. So I'm just going to put it out there. Yep. Everything, you know, the real raw shit and then let people 
either gravitate towards it or people can keep living their life, which, mm -hmm. you know, they've composed it to be something which is, is a fake lifestyle. You know? right. Or you can be real with yourself. And the sooner you're, you're real with yourself, you mm. can get to loving who you are. Because it's, mm. it's hard to love like a, a fake version of yourself. You know? Yeah. <laughs> that version of yourself usually sucks. I think exactly. it's Brene Brown who says like, is it Brene Brown? I can't remember, but it's like, I want to change my life without actually changing anything about my life. <laughs> right. And it's like, well, if you're able to kind of take an inventory, and I think unfortunately that's why we usually see this kind of shit, like, you know, mental breakdowns and things happen mm -hmm. in people's lives in their later 20s because right. your teen years are filled with so much fucking drama anyway. Right. Like, you're building who you are, your hormones mm -hmm. are fucking nuts. Like, that's why I find what you do in like wanting to work with teens. Like I think all teens are cunts. All teens are assholes. <laughs> like I, me included. I was a big. It, it, it's normal, you know? Yeah. But like now you're in a even more heightened state of right. um, mental like uh, uh, snapsies firing off. Right. So tell me about your decision to go work with teens and maybe how that's different from adults. So it's actually funny because uh, it's a great story. I was on TikTok live and then the owner of Visions, she reached out and she's like, hey, we have this great center. You can work with teams. It can be part time. I know social media is your full time. So you don't have to burn yourself out like you were doing in Virginia. So I, I replied back to her on December 4th because she, she sent me the screenshot. And I was like, oh, I mean, thank you so much. I'll bookmark this for future whatever. And she's yeah. like, oh, you can't bookmark me. So she kept being like, she stayed on it. And, you know, yeah. then I was back and forth. They got me out here. I was out in Thousand Oaks looking at the yeah. center. And the way that they were operating their, their business, I liked it. And then getting to talk with the teens, like, I saw that, okay, I can make a difference here. And if you catch a teenager at the right point in their life, mm. you can, it's easier to, you know, help out a kid than to have mm. to, like, fix a, an adult, you know? By the time you're totally. 25, 30, 35, you have all these toxic tendencies that you picked up. Yeah. And it's become your way of life and it's yeah. embedded into your identity. So it's <laughs> yeah. hard to like, to break that. You have to change who you are mm. at the core. So and that's why not, easier. Yeah. Why not catch them when they're 15, 16, you know? Yeah. And when, like, if you want to help somebody, like the kids will gravitate towards you. And like, you have to have boundaries. Like if they don't mm. want the help, then Hey, like you have to want the help for me to help you out. Mm, you know, mm -hmm. so I figured out, you know what, I'd love to work a day or two or three a week and then do social media. It fit into yeah. my, my plan, you know. That's so it's perfect. Not, it's not something that I wouldn't have done if I didn't want to do it. So I'm excited to work with the kids. Yeah, it's it does sound like a nice balance. I've honestly, I dropped out of three colleges. I told you I went to Auburn, then I moved to New York City, and then moved to LA, and I've tried to do college in all of those cities, and I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's not for me. Just give me a camera and let me start making shit. Um, and, 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 and you're good at that, you know? Thank you. I try very hard and it was never ever my fucking intention to get into mm. the mental health space you know when i worked at buzzfeed that's mm. really when i felt the safest i've ever felt mm. to talk about it like right you know i felt okay i've got a paycheck i've got good health insurance like they're not gonna fire me because i'm fucking fucked up like if right. anything this is just like my therapy and the response mm. was so incredible that yeah. you know it wasn't one of those things where then I felt obligated to do it it was like mm -hmm. a fucking weight off my shoulders and you know the best messages I still get you know in my dms especially now that the book's out is when people say I thought I was the only person in the fucking world who thought this thought or did this thing or mm -hmm. thought I was dealing with this thing and to read about it is making me feel so different now and I'm like right. that is why I do it is because mm -hmm. I've been that teen in the exactly. invasion center like sneaking coke into the fucking bathroom and like <laughs> oh god i was just a i was just Mickey, an asshole Mickey, wow. i was not great i was a problem but i but i it's didn't part of your story yeah and i didn't want to change back then like i had to mm. make i really had to hit you know rock bottom as they say right. and my rock bottom is still a pretty soft bottom considering like i didn't lose everything in my life right. like i think again it's like get catching those people exactly what you're saying like catching them before they have these instilled habits because it's really hard to break a habit once you're like in your 30s but exactly. i have to imagine they must think you're so cool like well, you're a tiktok star well i haven't actually got to meet 
uh, the majority of them. But when I went, I just like went in like regular clothes. I didn't yeah. go with the, the TikTok gear. But uh, I ah. guess maybe, once they find out, like like that would be enough to get their attention. Right. You have to get if you want to teach anybody something, you have to get their attention first. Yeah. So if I get their attention, then they'll say, oh, he communicates in our language. You know, right. the, the issue with all of mental health is people talk in all these big words and, you know, mm. the general public can't understand, understand what's going on. Yeah. You know, so how can you make a difference when you can't communicate? Like you have to mm. speak in their language, you know, like mm-hmm. bring it down, make everything mm-hmm. at like an eighth grade reading level. So right. that way you miss nobody. Well, I, and I think too, like you're doing such important work, right? Like, mm-hmm and doing the social media how were you nervous at all to kind of like put your shit out there to kind of be known as like the mental health guru or were you already so comfortable with talking about that so it took me a while like I had Mm. to work up to it and like I, I feel like the way my life went like everything led up to this point you know so going back to my book you already won and uh, I wrote the book. I, li- I liked everything about the book. The one chapter that I was hesitant to talk about uh, in the book was when I got diagnosed with ADHD in grad school mm. because, you know, I was working, I was doing a little bit of social media. Like I had a clothing company promoting mental oh, awareness. Sweet. I was, uh, you know, working on the book a little bit. I was in grad school getting a DMP and then I was also teaching at the university. So oh, there, was wow. rumor, there was a rumor going around that uh, I was doing cocaine. And I heard mm. this from my sister who was classmates with some of the students that I was teaching. Like, oh, <laughs> Ojo must be doing cocaine because he's doing like a million different things at once. Yeah. So obviously like with the ADHD thing, I felt mm. like people were going to attribute my success to, oh, he got diagnosed with ADHD. He had to take Adderall, all this other stuff. Oh, so geez. I thought about that for a second. And then I said, no, I have to be as authentic as possible. Yeah. And I put that part out in the book and then you know with a book it's in print it's out there for life right you know? yeah <laughs> so it, it's out there and once I put that out there and I saw people like reacted to it mm. it gave me more confidence and then mm. after I graduated I wanted to work um back at the hospital where I was doing my rotations with you know and then the psychiatrist who trained me like he was like hey you want to come and work with us and I was mm. waiting to work with them but they didn't have a spot oh, uh, wow. and, and my recruiter called me and they had a job in Virginia and I was seven eight hours away from home i knew wow. nobody out there i had nothing but free time so mm. when you're when you're not around people that you came up with right you kind of become like a brand new person yeah and new the thing kid. about tiktok is like on instagram you have people that you knew from high school and people that go yeah. to your church and things like that uh. so they know you as a certain type of person yeah so like you might feel like the weight of their judgment on your shoulders yeah but on totally. tiktok you can be a brand new person yep. like, create an account and just put your story out there. So yep. I created my account and I was out there in Virginia. I didn't know anybody. I had nothing but free time. So I was go. just putting my story out there and I wasn't having to worry about going to work with the same people that I had been with. Like I went yeah. to a whole new environment, you know, and I didn't even tell my coworkers about my TikTok account. Like they would eventually, they're like, oh, I saw you on TikTok. And then they're like, oh, let me hear about your book and things like that. But ah. I just went about my business. And now I've like, got all this confidence to the point where like you can say what you want to say about me i don't really care like there you go at most if i see like i'll block and like i'll go by my day but, yeah like I, like I just don't i care less and less every day but what somebody <laughs> else thinks about me the block button is your best friend yeah, and is. i you know i've been on the internet for over 10 years now and every now and then i don't read the comments because i don't feed the trolls um uh-huh. but every now and then i'll get a message where i'm just like it brings me back back to that like salty right. place where I'm like, oh wait, I I've learned to turn that into like compassion for the other person, and exactly. I'll send them a nice message, and then I block their ass, and exactly yeah. what you said. But I think you know if anyone's listening, any confidants out there, you know who are nervous about to kind of come forward with, you know your diagnosis or talk about it with coworkers or family or friends, like take it from two people who literally were able to like make careers and connections and right. you know you said the same thing it was like it built your confidence and i think mm-hmm. that's one thing about mental illness or you know disorders or whatever you want to call it especially when you're dealing with those more severe diagnoses you know the schizophrenia right, the bipolar right, right. it makes you feel so fucking 
insecure and yeah. not confident because we still don't fucking know exactly how to treat it. You know, like we can go back and do trauma work and somatic and we can, you know, medicate and, you know, we're, we're getting there, but I have to imagine it's also really scary you know, at first for the people who, who still don't even kind of understand what their diagnosis is themselves. It's very scary. And, and actually, a funny thing that ha happens is at the psych hospitals, there's like a hierarchy of mental mm -hmm. illnesses. So like, I've witnessed patients who, let's say they were in there for generalized anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. They would look at the person who's schizophrenic and say, oh, you're, that person is really crazy. Like, right. I'm, I don't belong here. Right. You know, so like, People would rather be anxious than schizophrenic. You'd rather oh, be yeah. bipolar than, because like, schiz like schizophrenia, like it just like it's the way it to sounds. It's supposed be the scariest. You know, and you, you treat it with antipsychotics, which means right. like anti and my psychotic. You know, so yeah. like the way you word things is important. I'll say, oh, this is a medication that's gonna help. You know, mm. allow your thoughts to be more organized. Mm. You know, but I mean, I'll, I'll give yeah. them the the pamphlet, which will say. You know how dollars that press an antipsychotic, but mm, I, I don't want so. to put put them into a a box like a box like okay yes like with that label because yes. that can damage their self esteem. Yes. You know? Oh my god! And like I think you drew the line perfectly. It's like once you hit bipolar and schizophrenia, you become unhinged, unhireable, right. unfriendable. Uh, like you become mm -hmm. like there is really this line where I think people are like you're either certified crazy or just like crazy because exactly. you're anxious and depressed and like everyone's anxious and depressed now and exactly. it's like there is this line in the sand that's yeah. like oh but you're not like not hireable and like interruptive of my daily life in right. a way that's going to cost a lot of money and care and exactly you know as society you know i i wrote a little chapter in the book about like your rights as, you know, an employee, like your mental health rights that you can't be mm -hmm. discriminated against because of right. mental health disorders. But I would assume it would be really scary for someone who is managing uh, their symptoms to take like a full-time job yeah. that is dealing with people in public. And, yeah. you know, I, I, I hate to think that someone would have to alter their dreams in order mm -hmm. to fit kind of like a diagnosis or a management right that's how things i imagine would have been in the past you know mm. for example like let's just take schizophrenia for example mm -hmm. if you're schizophrenic and you take your medication every day first of all it's hard to take the same thing every single day for the rest of your life yeah so but then you know medicine's evolving we have long acting injectables and we're doing our best to try and figure things out on that end but it's like you're taking meds every single day and then like you have to like you don't want anybody to see like your pill bottle. You don't want people to know like what you're taking. Yeah. And then like, if you disclose it ahead of time, you'll know if they're going to not hire you because they're going to think that you're crazy or they're going to think that you're aggressive or right. if conflict arises in the workplace, they're going to feel like you're going to wild out. Right. When, peop when people have fights, everybody like has fights and yeah. disagreements. So it's like, yeah, it's almost like, it's this big secret that you're holding in. Yes. And it's like, you don't want anybody to know. Yes. And you, like that's a lot of weight on your shoulders to live that way think about it like you're living like you've constructed this person this version of yourself that goes to work every day and gets a stable paycheck and i can imagine it's hard for a lot of people like if mm -hmm. like fortunately for me i, don't ha I just have a pup you know, I have a kid. so like <laughs> yeah like i was able to oh, like kids oh my god right i was able to like come out here to california like i can live off a sixth of what I made last year because wow. like, I don't buy, like I don't buy things like, yeah. <laughs> like there's nothing that I want right now that I can think of that like I need, yeah, sure. you know, but for somebody who has kids and let's say oh, a wife and a family, it's like, like, why would you put your story out online yeah. if it could take away from you putting food on the table? Like that's right. a very real conversation. 100%. If I was in that position. I, like I'm a family oriented person. I wouldn't like, I would not share my story if it would take away from my wife and kids eating. Yeah, I don't blame, I don't blame you those know, people at all. That person's living in a mental prison, you yes. know, and, and it's tough because they have to, like, they want to be authentic or they'll see me and you be like authentic on social media yeah. and they'll say, you know what? I want to be like them, but I can't because like my son has to eat, you know? Right. Uh, and like, I hope it happens in my lifetime that I get to see it because, you know, I think, I think it will actually. Yeah. Well, like I, I, you know, not to go like too, too off topic, but like, look at 
Kanye, look at fucking yeah. Elon Musk. Like look at people that are in these very high positions of power that are brilliant, creative geniuses. I mean, mm -hmm. some, you know, bipolar people that I know are the most fucking intelligent, right. creative, yeah. wonderful fucking people. Like we wouldn't have what we have in society without mm -hmm. them. Yeah. And, you know, I think unfortunately we've seen the way that the media has treated Kanye. And I think it is like putting us forward and then right. setting us back like 10 fucking years because we have someone who's willing to talk about it publicly. And then anytime something happens, we're either going like, oh, it's just his mania or like, oh, he's just exactly. mentally ill or he's fucking crazy and fucked up and he's saying that shit on his own volition. And like, I don't think the world has caught up to us that no. And, you know, I say this all the time is like, I genuinely think the, you know, GAD brains, the bipolar, the schizophrenic, the, you know, spectrum, like I really do think our brains are more advanced than society is willing to allow. And it sounds a little conspiracy theory that it's like, oh, the, the man's trying to keep us down. But I genuinely believe like we're going to evolve to a society where we're just like, oh yeah, that person has like, whatever, who cares? <laughs> right. no, no, I can see that because you have to exert so much mental energy mm. to do what you're doing. Your brain mm -hmm. is moving so fast, mm -hmm. you know? So in terms of like, breaking the stigma and making it acceptable to talk about like when i see the kanye news and mm. you know like i've seen how it's like for families bringing people in who are bipolar mm -hmm. but they've had the you know, opportunity to keep things private like this has right. to be broadcasted and like people will take people will love say, oh she's getting divorced but, mm. but like at the end of the day that's somebody's actual life yeah. there's actual human beings involved there's a marriage yeah. about the breakup there, there's right. kids and involved yeah you know, so and also like i don't know if he struggles to accept his diagnosis but like yeah. he's put out brilliant work you know yeah. uh, and it's that lose you for a second i you're frozen <laughs> uh, okay i think we're okay <laughs> okay we're back i chat. think we're back um if not um we'll figure it out but this might actually be a fantastic place to wrap up anyway because I could talk about this shit forever, but I know I could too. it's yeah. Monday. We should definitely stay connected 100%. For but sure. I want the audience to know like how they can, you know, not only find you, but find in uh, find information on how to do what you do. Um, because like I said, you have a podcast ar archived about um, becoming a, a do psychiatric doctor, nurse practitioner. So right. give me a little bit of like, how can people find you? And then also how can people find out about like how to help the world be a better place? Okay, so uh, thank you for the opportunity, by the way. Uh, the best way to find me is uh, obviously Instagram at Dr. Kojo Sato, and then TikTok is at Dr. Kojo Sato. Uh, my podcast on uh, Apple Music or um, Spotify is on all those networks, and uh, that talks about my educational journey, and that's how you can do what I do professionally. And in terms of doing what I do like now with social media, uh, I would say just follow my TikTok and then look at the content and then mm -hmm. you will, once you watch that, other people who do similar things will pop up on your For You page. And in terms of yes. wanting information about mental health, uh, an organization that I'm partnered up with, Mental Health America, they're the largest nonprofit that serves um, Americans with mental health issues. Uh, they're located okay. in Washington, D.C. So uh, if you go to my, the, the link in my Instagram and my TikTok bio, uh, you can get to the Mental Health America website there, and you can also take a free screen to uh, uh, screening assessment. It won't diagnose no, you, but, but it'll it'll key you on on the fact that you might be having symptoms of mania, oh, anxiety, depression, uh, things like that. And it's it's completely great. free, and people don't know about that. I didn't even know about that because I I don't partner with Mental Health America. I do NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. That's more for like I love NAMI resource. as well. Yeah, but I didn't know about that that's great that's like a, a quiz very buzzfeed um but for something <laughs> that can help change your life um right. kojo thank you so much for doing this um i'm gonna stay in touch with you for sure i'll for sure. get you my book uh everyone make sure to also go check out his book mm. and we will see you next week bye confidence thanks so much